The following program is an original production of WICC PBS Chicago. Closed captioning for the professors is provided in part by the Clifford Law Offices, a personal injury and wrongful death law firm in Chicago. The cost of going to college has increased at a rate faster than the cost of living over the past 30 years. One year at a public in-state university now costs more than $22,000, including room and board. Private colleges are almost double that figure. As a result, many students are left with huge student loans that burden them for years. Some have started to question whether getting a college degree is even worth it anymore. That's the focus of our discussion today on The Professors. Joining us today to talk about whether getting a college degree is worth the expenses are Agra Dima, Professor of Political Science at Chicago State University, Dr. Jaime Dominguez, Professor of Political Science at Northwestern University, Edward Davis, Professor of African American Studies and Anthropology at Malcolm X College, and Rashid Carter, Business Professor at Harold Washington College. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So obviously, not only do we uh, look at this from an academic perspective, but uh, many of us have student loan debts as well. Right. So this conversation will probably end up being uh, relatively personal. Now, I want to start the conversation off with really thinking about the, um, the rising cost of college tuition. Uh, literally, uh, since 1978, uh, college tuition and fees have surged uh, literally over a thousand percent, while medical expenses have gone up 600 percent during that time and food expenses only 244 percent during that same period. So the question that we have to start off with today is really is college education worth the rising cost that many people are facing? I don't want to. No, I think I, absolutely. I mean, I, we're all, I think all of us are going to promote and encourage uh, for one to get their education. I mm -hmm. think that's very, very important. Um, but at the same time, I think it depends on the actual school and it depends on you know, what is it that you would like to pursue and what kind of career you would like to What do you have? mean it depends on the actual Well, story. it depends, for example, if you, um, let's say you want to go into science, okay. right? You may want to go to, to medical school, you want to go to a okay. prestigious medical school, right? Then you probably do want to try to get into the best program that you possibly can. There's going to be an added cost to that. Uh, so that's what I meant by that. Okay. Um, but, you know, I, I, what I want to say is I don't, if you're not sure, I don't think, for example, going to... Uh, to say a private university that's almost more than fifty thousand dollars of you know tuition, sure. room and board, sure. and you're just trying to figure it out. You know, I I think you need to have those important conversations beforehand and be as informed as you possibly can. So I think that that conversation maybe isn't happening enough, and yeah. it needs to happen given well, what you've you. You make a very out. good point because literally twenty five percent of college graduates are in jobs that don't even require a college degree. Mm. So you've got these people spending, like myself, I've spent to a private uh, graduate school. I uh, spent a lot of money on it. I'm using mine, by the way, okay? Yeah, yeah. Thank, okay. As we oh, all are, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, but, uh, you know, my dad was very adamant uh, in my life about not getting student loans. And I didn't undergrad. I, I didn't listen to him for graduate school because I felt that I, I should. However, he, here's a situation. My father went and was an entrepreneur and never finished college and probably makes about five times as much money as I do right now uh, and is doing very well for himself. So really... Uh, as and I think this is very important because we all influence students. Should we be telling our students that maybe college is not for them? Well, I think what, should, what we should be telling students is to be more thoughtful about the decision. Okay. Because we don't. I, I know we've romanticized this whole notion of higher education, where you just you go to college as a rite of passage, and you go and you have fun, and you have fun for four years. You pick up a degree along the way, and then you'll be ready for a job. And then after you get a job, you might work for forty years. Then you can retire and have life uh, lived happily ever after. And that paradigm is obviously broken, and that doesn't tell the reality. The reality is that um, you'll go to college, you'll get a degree, and if you haven't properly thought about or projected, you know, what sort of uh, occupations are going to be in demand, if you haven't anticipated what the market is going to evolve to by the time you graduate, um, then you might be stuck in a situation where you owe money and you're not able to gain proper returns to pay back okay. some of that All cost. Right. But Professor Carter, I have to say this before, and I want to open this up, but so you're telling me that we should tell students that we should, they shouldn't be following their heart in terms of what they want to study. They should be looking at the trends in the marketplace and, and, and basically choosing careers based on that. No, no, I, I say that they should 
use as much information as possible to fuel their decision. Okay. And so I, what I teach my Business 111 students, for instance, is um, if you want to be an entrepreneur, you have to make sure your heart is there. Whatever you want to do, whatever avocation you choose, make sure, certain that your heart is in it. Okay. But once we kind of get that out the way, then think very practically about what is the implication behind this decision and what is it going to look like in terms of dollars and cents into the future. That's the thing we need to teach our students that we simply do not teach. Okay. Right. And one thing we have to do is make sure that our students uh, understand the process of planning. Right, understand the process from high school, planning for college, planning after college, planning what they would potentially do with that degree. If they do uh, complete a degree in fine arts, okay, what exactly would they do with that? If they complete a degree uh, in a bachelor's in science, what exactly would they do with that? Uh, we, we do have to make sure that we have people who go on to become doctors, go on to become <coughs> lawyers, go on to certain institutions and universities so that they can be the leaders of tomorrow. Uh, but at the same time, we have other options for people. Uh, this isn't to discourage or meant to discourage someone from attending college if that's what they want to do. Uh, but definitely, uh, what are the other choices? Yeah. Do you all have to go to uh, a private four-year institution, or is there some other sort of option that you could take? Certainly, we need uh, people who do complete those degrees because we need our, our future leaders of tomorrow. We need our doctors. We need our, our uh, professionals. That's right. Okay. So, you know, President Obama uh, passed a piece of legislation uh, last year about student loans. It's such a huge issue. That it, 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 Acquired the attention of the White House, and it literally what it did was it did basically three things. It um, limited um, uh, repayment for uh, borrowers, new borrowers, to 10 percent of their disposable income, and then the, and then the second two parts of this had to do with debt forgiveness. So uh, for uh, people who pay their loans on time, new borrowers, they get automatic debt forgiveness after 20 years. And those who went into public service, uh, like what we do, they would get, uh, as long as they pay their debts on time, they would get debt forgiveness after 10 years. So this is the legislation that's coming down the pike now, which is actually very exciting. But I, I have read, you know, collectively, we have about a trillion dollars in student debt as a nation. So if, do you think this kind of policy is enough? Or what else ought we be doing to change this dynamic? Can I interject sure. here? Um, I think for me, I take a philosophical approach to the fundamental question, which is, is co the cost of college, as it is these days, w worth it? And the emphasis here is on worth. And I would like to say that that is a personal choice. It's not a collective decision. When we go to the marketplace to purchase items that we need for our usage, we don't make a collective decision. We make an individual decision based on utility maximization. At least that's what the economists tell us. Yeah, but the economy so, has price controls too for, yeah, so for certain goods. If somebody charges you gazillion dollars for college education, mm -hmm. and you look down the line, and you look at the implications of your life after you get that, you have a choice to make. You may and decide. Yeah, you, 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 do, you do. You do. You, you, you may you, decide that this is not worth for me. But Dr. Demon, we're dealing with eighteen-year-olds, right? Okay, I know. Who are strapping know, on these I know. enormous amounts but of debt? But don't go to college, accumulate loans, and then turn back and say, "Oh, I, the I, cost see, is too much." Yeah. And, and I think that happens. Uh, this conversation we're having, uh, as we <laughs> rightly know, this report, a uh, disproportionate share of folks who are put in this. Mm -hmm conundrum tend to be um, ethnic and racial minorities. And right. so, and, and I think a lot of it has to do, I think, with just the way that the landscape has shifted, the educational landscape has shifted. And, but I think, I know personally my job uh, as an educator is, I try to have these conversations early on with people as, as early as possible and with their parents. Because right. as you said, these 18-year-olds, 18, 18 17-year-olds don't know. Um, their parents might know some, but yeah. my experience is a good, a good chunk of them do not know how it, the landscape has shifted. And yeah. so, but you're right; it is a personal choice. But I think it's important that um, you know we, we not allow these educational institutions, which some have actually now have followed the kind of the corporate model yeah. of. Yeah seeing students as consumers, and yeah. so w I think that's where we need to bring in the conversation. Right. And, 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 and let's also recognize that there's information asymmetry here, right? So it's not like uh, the students and then the institutions have the same information. The, the institution has information that the students simply don't have, which is why they allow for the credit card companies to set up kiosks on the first day of class. I know I, know I remember that in the 90s at the University of Illinois Champaign, right? Mine too. Uh, and so <laughs> yeah, and, but what does that do? Just as, just, just as you're getting education in business, English, whatever your major field of study might be, what you're also learning is not to really 
appreciate what it means to be in debt. Because you're, take, you're getting these credit cards, you're using them irresponsibly, and so, oh yeah, I'll take out another loan for my education. You don't really understand the implication at that point in time, but later on you do understand the implication. And so I think we're really saying similar things here. You just want to make an informed decision ahead of time. And I think it's, it's incumbent upon the institution to provide those educational apparatus for the students. But then, of course, it's also about personal responsibility. Yeah. And so we have to also nurture that sort of understanding on our own. Yeah, if, if you pursue liberal arts education, we don't do that to say, okay, here is what you will get when you graduate. We emphasize your ability to think and survive in the world as it is. And wherever that takes you is fine. That is why you have so many liberal arts graduates pursuing fees other than sure. ones in which they were trained. But the fundamental question remains, if we are going to saddle our young people with heavy debt, mm -hmm. such as it is now, we have foreclosed in perpetuity opportunities for them to better Absolutely. themselves economically. Absolutely. And yeah. it is yeah. sad. It is. I tell my students, if you can, don't take any loans at all. And if you take any loans, make sure that you take them as minimally as possible, which is why community colleges are wonderful. Absolutely. You can That's come right. here, pay cheaply, without taking any loans and get skills that can enable you to get a job that pays well. Yeah. Now here's what I, th I think is interesting as well. <clears throat> if we look at all these numbers about how uh, college education has increased over the past mm -hmm. 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, but you realize about half of that cost is tuition and the other half has to do with textbooks and medical fees, et cetera. The average student uh, pays basically about $600 a semester for books. Now this is one area that I think fundamentally we can take responsibility for. Absolutely. And I think fundamentally we don't say to the students, oh, it's your responsibility, it's your fault, you've got to figure it out, because we're assigning these textbooks and they're, they're, they're strapped with this. And so this is a conversation, I'd like to open up the conversation a little bit to talk about the cost of textbooks and what do you all think about that and how do we address that question? Well, one thing I would say for my own situation uh, in the classes that I teach uh, for a 100 level class, for instance. I know the students are just arriving. Uh, maybe this is their first semester, second semester. Uh, I don't really know what everyone's uh, financial aid situation might be. Do they receive a book voucher? Do they not receive a book voucher? But I make it a point to have a textbook which is available at the Chicago Public Library and to have secondary readings that are also available for free at the library. And I show on the very first day. Uh, I show over the overhead projector, this is where you can find it, this is how you reserve the book, this is how you do, uh, put it on hold, have, you, uh, have it available to pick up at your neighborhood library, and I give them that option. Sure. Uh, I love the bookstore, uh, <laughs> but there can be some price hey, be inflation now, yeah. at times to have, for that 100 so, level, free books available so do at you the, all at think that library. we have a responsibility let's, let's literally pull it right back yes. to us so yeah. not talk about yeah. society yes. Oh, yeah. we yeah. have yes. the Absolutely. decision Absolutely. to make before a semester starts yes. about how many books yeah. that these students will need etc what is our responsibility? In this? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think about when I was a student, I used to get upset. My friends were like, why did you buy this book? You only read like a third of it, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, so I'm very cognizant of that. So, uh, for example, there are some texts I want to use right now. I won't name the actual presses, mm -hmm. but there's a certain couple, two presses in particular. That they're just, I think it's just outrageous what they charge. Over $100 for a textbook. Yeah. It's just, I just want to sign it. You know, and I know these individuals, these authors, but there's nothing that they can do. It, it, the publisher kind of sets that standard. So I will choose other venues, either try to come up, a little more work on my end, but I'm, I'm happy to do it. I may come up with more a collection of readings that can maybe capture themes or elements of that text that I want mm -hmm. to uh, have my students understand. Uh, also, I will make sure that you know, I try to use the same books so that students can actually buy, use. Sure versions of it. Yeah. So yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, I'm definitely cognizant yeah. about that. And what I'd like to provide, just to echo your sentiments, is a menu of options for the right. students. So, there, so that uh, there's a menu of avenues that you can uh, a menu that has a, a selection of uh, different resources that you can use in order to get uh, access to the knowledge that you'll need to be successful in the course, um, which includes using texts that are uh, older, right? Because over editions, a few subsequent editions, they oh, don't really yeah. change that oh, much, yeah. right? Right, right? But you also right. see... Well, you guys say that quietly, uh, I know, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what you also see is that 
the there. textbook companies are responding. I don't know if this is you guys' experience in um, in your fields, but in economics, uh, what we find is that they're offering these e-textbooks that, that are a lot cheaper, bundled mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. supportive mm -hmm. software, yes. supplementary mm -hmm. software. Mm -hmm. So it seems like, and I would imagine that somewhere there's a bottom line um, being calculated that is, you know, uh, sort of uh, echo echoing the, the conversation we're having now. But these textbook publishers are listening to the things that we're talking about, and they're making decisions to propagate their best interests. Yes. Absolutely. I, I normally go for paperbacks, paperbacks, and I'm very sensitive to pricing. The other thing uh, that is important to note is that the publishers uh, sometimes do not allow you to adopt the, ten the same textbook uh, in two consecutive years because they have annual editions. The, yes. Mm -hmm. The Absolutely. students have to purchase Absolutely. new ones, Absolutely. especially right. in international relations. Mm -hmm. They have uh, texts that come up for 2013, 2014. And by the year, uh, the end of the school year, they have another textbook. And the price is always yeah. up in yeah. that mm -hmm. range. And, and yeah. there are minimal changes, as we've talked about. I mean, I, you know, I've worked with publishers of you know, edited textbooks, et cetera. The changes from year to year are not that drastic or significant, and, and you know, and so there may be some, and you know, especially in the political field, uh, you know, obviously things are changing every year, but the concepts still stay the same, and there are a lot of ways to continue with older information. I agree with you all. I do a, a customized textbook. I take out all the color in the book. I take out all the, you know the extra picture. I take out the hard mm -hmm. cover and try to get the book down, and still the cost of that book keeps creeping up. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a real issue. But let me, let me say this uh, overall as well about the greater question of, uh, of college cost. Uh, you know, students are paying literally, you know, many students, you, you know, you mentioned $52,000 for your institution, our uh, public institution is about $22,000. You know, a student can go to a, a trade school for about eight weeks or ten weeks and pick up a skill in technology or, you know, whatever it may be, you know, hair, care, whatever it is, for literally a fraction of that cost, you know, $10,000 right. or whatever. That's right. And I'm wondering if we ought to be pushing our students, and I'm not saying that we push, you know, and I know it's not a one-size-fits-all, but it's very frustrating when you think about this. I used to work for a congressman, and I shared this story with you guys before we started. I used to work for a congressman who had been in Congress for 10 years. He was paying his student loans. President Obama didn't finish paying his student loans until he had been running for president and, and sold millions of dollars worth of book copies. And Bill Clinton didn't finish his until he was in the White House. And so when I look at that, I say, man, you doggone have to become famous and become president to pay your student loans off. Should we be looking at these other kinds of uh, options, these vocational options uh, for many students? Absolutely. Absolutely. In, in the United States, this is the only country where college education is for everybody. Mm -hmm. Everywhere else in Europe, mm -hmm. especially in England, they have a pyramid type arrangement mm -hmm. where only the very best gets to the top. Mm -hmm. The rest of the people mm -hmm. attend polytechnics and ah. trade schools. And that's, that's anti-American, you know that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> in the yeah, sense yeah. of yeah. people say, hey, wait a second, everybody yeah. should be able to make it in America. I so know. You're saying maybe, I know. You know. So here, everybody is expected to go to college. And the demand on services and costs on the colleges is higher as a result of that. Mm -hmm. But over in England, you have a situation where uh, enrollment in colleges is very small compared to the population. Mm. So we have this idea that we have to educate everybody. Mm -hmm. And the costs are associated uh, with that aspect of. You know what's even, I'm sorry, you know what's even scarier about what you just said is that we're not educating everybody. So what happens is, literally, we still have about a third of people in our, in our culture that mm -hmm. have a four-year mm -hmm. college degree. But that is the and largest right, in the world. No, and, and the minority communities, it's much smaller. And I know it's the largest in the world, but mm -hmm. having said all of that, there are a lot of folks in our, in our country who are paying all this money and still not finishing those degrees. I and know. that's or, a huge or, issue or, as well. Or, 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 so different is, studies about the value added after four years or mm -hmm. five years or six years from a college experience yeah. demonstrate that the students are not really learning a whole lot. Mm -hmm. They're going through the motions of getting a degree, but um, are they really adding value to unless themselves? Unless they take or one, one of our classes. That's, that's right. right. <laughs> okay. so, uh, yeah, right. So, <laughs> and go to one of our workshops. That's right. And they're learning something at all. I agree. But, but so. I think that's, that's the thing we have to think about. That's the thing that has to be seated in the minds of young people, right? Is how, how are you going to add value to yourself as a productive citizen in the market? 
value-based economy. One of the things that I, I talk to my um, uh, introductory business students about is the fact that if you look at the most prosperous Americans, um, the model, um, if we had to generalize a model for what that individual looks like, it's someone who comes to school, they're able to target a market opportunity, and then they, they customize their education so that they, they are prepared to take full advantage of that opportunity. And so most millionaires and billionaires, in fact, only have an associate's or a bachelor's degree. They don't have a professional degree. So what does that say? The research demonstrates that you go to college and you take it, you take college courses, you take a, a major based upon how it's going to apply to your life trajectory. But you have to think about that ahead of time how so you, you can make good decisions. How do you do that at 18? How do you do that at 18? By having good instructors and mentors <laughs> like you, you, know, know, you, you know, when I was a graduate student, we have a thing, a club that mm -hmm. met in a bar on Friday, and we called it spazzing. Students for political yeah. action and scientific. It was a club that met in a bar on a Friday. Yeah. yeah. You guys got something accomplished? <laughs> yes. And, and an intellectual. <laughs> students for, poli <laughs> students for political that. action and scientific methodology. Okay. Spazzing. Wow. And when we met there, we were talking about worldly philosophical things. You mm -hmm. talk about making money after college, you would be denounced. Sure. Mm -hmm. Because making money like, was like dirt. It is only when you get up out of college and you have bills to pay that you say, how about spazzing? Sure. That's, yeah, right. Exactly. that's right. That's right. But that's I right. know what you are saying. But the other thing we should also think about is foreign students pay twice the amount of resident tuition that is charged. If they go to state schools, at Chicago State, undergraduate foreign students are paying about $25,000. Wow. Mm -hmm. So you, yeah. you look at it, they, they have money that they, they are not qualified for anything. No book voucher, no financial, right, no financial aid, right. and they are right. not qualified to work outside our campus. But if, we general, but if we generalize very that important. student, um, just to get your perspective, is that student typically going and studying romance languages? Or are they studying in a STEM field, right? A field that's going to make them that, yeah. that's going to make them that. um, very much in demand in the marketplace, and that's going to regale returns that are going to be able to pay back Generally some of those debts, speaking, right? Yeah. And so, I mean, but that's part of uh, so that information was seeded in their minds when they wanted to make that decision. And so, I think that's the sort of conversation we need to be having. Yeah. So, students need to be watching this show. And they need to be, um, again, just creating that sort of conversation on their own. Because I know this is more than just a rumor. Um, this is a conversation that's happening in a lot of different places. And so turn off the iTunes, you know, um, have, get together, have a spasm, do what you have to do, but yeah. these conversations need to happen. Just not but at I, the bar, probably. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah right, just, that's right. I, mean, I just know, want to touch on something okay. that, that Agbar was saying a minute ago. Uh, as far as uh, education overseas and, and, and foreign students, and foreign nationals, uh, I was able to study at University of Cambridge, mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I ended up my uh, master's in anthropology there. And I was fortunate enough to have a scholarship uh, to, to be there, but uh, what I learned there is that the uh, UK system of education, uh, while it is very elitist in some respects, uh, it also, they also receive a very grounded K through 12 education mm -hmm. that greatly prepares them for the university. So with the A-level exams or O-level exams and so forth, they don't have to take those general education courses that we would take here. They have that accomplished in the K through 12 level. Yeah. And so we really have to, in this country, invest greatly in our K through 12 system so that we can have students who do enter into the four-year institution, uh, whether it's the University of Illinois or the University of Chicago, and they're able to enter directly into uh, a medical professional program uh, to become a doctor or become a lawyer or become whatever they might intend to, to do, and they don't have to take the time with the general eds the way they You know, you, you make a very good point uh, because, you know, graduate, graduate life in England is completely different. different you totally know, different. There's a, lot, there's a lot more uh, self-guided research, et cetera, uh, than there is course taking uh, as, as we have here. But is, doesn't that come down to the American principle uh, or model or ethos of, uh, of competition, right? Because really what I find, uh, and if you hear the, the language around education today from a, from a, a national perspective, it's all about competition. Mm -hmm. And what I think, as you're talking, one of the reasons why we have that is because I think that the general ed courses are designed to weed people out. They're designed to weed those folks who say, I want to be a doctor when I'm a kid, and then I get to college, and then this don't is crazy, biology. I don't want to do that. Right. Now, I'm not saying that's the right thing, but what I'm saying is, is that we live in a culture in which if everyone succeeds, that's not actually a good thing in America. 
because America is really built on this this pyramid model that you know you've got to there's got to be a number of people here and less people here, et cetera. That would require, I think, a complete revamping of the way we even look at education in this country. That everyone can succeed, and education is not about competition. Because it, it makes me cringe when the president uses that word. You know, and he says, "Oh, well, you know, we got to educate for competition. Why are we educating for competition? Education is not about competition." Well, I look at his initiative, right? Race mm -hmm. to the top, right? Yeah. Arnie Duncan to try to inspire more innovation, right? Yeah. In, in the school, to the thing, more fun. I mean, that that's an example of that. Yeah. You know, yeah. That, yeah. What it, race to the top? What he said also has implications for cost because a large number of schools now accept students. They go there, they don't take gen ed, they take remedial courses mm. that are not counted toward their degree. Right. And important. that adds to the cost. They can spend as much as a year taking those um, at zero, zero, zero something. Right. So if you accept students who are in that situation, the cost of education for them is going, going to be higher. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's right. But if we look at the issue of uh, student loan debt and those who do have the technical uh, backgrounds and technical degrees, uh, there are students who go to cosmetology schools who have twenty, thirty thousand dollars in student loan debt because of no. Wow. This is no, I know. I, of yeah, some. I mean, yeah. wow. It's, I know of some. So <laughs> how tragic. Yeah, barely. <laughs> And so we have, to, we have to understand how our culture of college in this country is really being geared towards getting people when they're 18 yeah. to get that credit card, to get that debt, yeah. and to be perpetually in debt as, a, as opposed to, I would say, uh, understanding economics, understanding the greater uh, financial system of this yeah. country, and being able to be an entrepreneur and take control so, of your own finances. So we don't have too much time left, but I think to wrap up what we're saying, it sounds like we're saying collectively that uh, education is good. <laughs> we, should, we should get education. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. But that our absolutely. students ought to start thinking more about what they're doing while they're doing it or even before they do it. And that we have to also look at alternatives to traditional four-year schools and more cost-effective alternatives. Uh, not to, you know, uh, uh, be completely an advertisement for city colleges, although we are advertising for city colleges. But once again, you make a very good point. $89 a credit hour that's quite Excellent. a deal yeah. for two yeah. years of college. Absolutely. Uh, and, uh, and, and maybe, you know, we've got to continue to reinforce those kinds of things. Uh, we'll take a, final, a couple final thoughts here, uh, and then we're going to wrap up. But so, go ahead. So in addition to the city colleges or community colleges across the country being good, cost-effective alternatives, um, what we do here at the city colleges is we give you a palette of options and routes that you can take. And we allow you to um, take on um, stackable credentials. And so at any point in time, if you say, I have a certificate in this area, I want to go and test, my, test the waters of the free market, uh, you sure. can do that. Or you can go ahead and you can progress to the next level of education. We are, Having um, those options are, are important. Thank you very much. We are out of time. Thank you all okay. so much. It's okay. been a fantastic conversation. That's our show for today, but you can go to WYCC.org right now to be a part of our continuing conversation. We'll see you next time on The Professors.